So, so thanks everyone for logging in for this installment of the National Fellow on Online Lecture Series. I'm Robbie Bowers at Emory Sports Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I will serve as the moderator for tonight's lecture. So before we get started with tonight, just want to plug the next lecture in the series, which will be next Wednesday, same time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. It'll be on sports neurology. The speaker will be uh, Jeffrey Kutcher, uh, who's one of the more well-known sports neurologists in, in the country and is the, you know, heads the concussion program for the NBA. James Robinson will serve as the moderator. And we'll just throw out there that we're not going to focus on concussion in this talk. It's going to be uh, all encompassing of sports neurology outside of concussion. So really focus on some of those topics that may be on the CAQ besides concussion. So tonight we have the great pleasure to have Dr. Brian Cray back from University of Washington talking about the kinetic chain and the biomechanics of sport. Before we get started with that, just some housekeeping items. And as a reminder, the, this program, the National Fellow Online Lecture Series, is to serve as an adjunct to your individual program's didactics, so not to take place of any of the didactics for, for your normal program. We're also wanting to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with a diverse group of AMSSM members and at times invited guest speakers. And overall, these lectures are really meant to help you help assist you in CAQ exam preparation. Just some reminders, mute your microphone, turn off your camera. You can submit your questions through the chat function. It, you can include your name and your program. That's always helpful so we know where the questions are coming from. I will ask the questions at the end during the Q&A session to Dr. Craybeck. And then after the program, if you'll please complete the evaluation, which will be sent at the end of the lecture. So Andy Meyer will put that into the chat function as well. So just follow that link and fill out that evaluation if you can. So again, tonight we have the great honor to have Dr. Brian Grayback from the University of Washington. He's professor of rehabilitation medicine, orthopedics, and sports medicine there at, at UW. And he is a national team physician for USA Swimming. So with that said, I will let Dr. Krayback go ahead and get started. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me as part of this. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about as part of this series um, and specifically on the kinetic chain and the biomechanics in the athlete. I'll first tell you that uh, that picture of mine's a little bit old, so I do need to update it as well. But uh, as mentioned, I am an, a professor at the University of Washington. It's part of our sports medicine clinic. Um, I spend time at uh, UW as well as Seattle Children's uh, as that. I um, actually had a prior stint, stint when I was in Baltimore uh, with the Baltimore Orioles. I have a little background in baseball as well. But now my time and focus is with USA Swimming and the national team physicians, and uh, one of the national team physicians traveling uh, with the team itself. So what we're going to do over this next time frame that we're together in our space is to learn a little bit more about the kinetic chain. I think most of us are familiar with the kinetic chain, but for this session, we're going to try and take a deeper dive into understanding the components of the kinetic chain and, and how that contributes to movement and function. Um, and we're going to illustrate that in, in a few sports, although the principles you're going to learn are really applicable to any sport. Um, but we're going to focus on baseball, uh, softball, running, and swimming as well. So let's get started with this. So I think most of us are pretty familiar with this concept of the kinetic chain, which was described a long time ago itself. And in essence, it's this this linkage uh, between the joints and the, the, the activation of the structures around the body that allow us to perform in sports, whether that's doing an overhead sports with throwing a baseball or a softball with a running sport and allowing us to sprint or, or, or run long distances, um, whether that's for a swimmer to move through the water or a gymnast to fly through the air on the various different apparatus. Every single sport, we incorporate the kinetic chain. And over our lifetime, we're learning the skills to activate those muscles and move those different joints 
to produce the optimal motion that hopefully leads to success and fun while we're contributing in sport. So we use the term, the kinetic chain, um, but we can really break that down into different components. So um, in this first part, we're going to talk about the difference between kinetics and kinematics um, and acknowledge that we sort of vacillate between those two. We're going to talk about the concept of this kinetic linkage, which I think is pretty familiar with most of us. There's a component of the sequencing, which plays uh, uh, an important uh role in the movement of different body parts, as well as that summation of speed with the acceleration, deceleration. Um, as we move through sports, we're utilizing both open and closed kinetic chain type of movements. And as that translates into rehabilitation, we utilize open and closed type of movements and acknowledging the complex interaction of those independent segments as we move through sport. After that, we'll move through and look at a variety of different videos where we can break down and really appreciate the, 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 the strength, the power in that motion and movement itself. And then we're going to spend a little time at the end um, talking about the swimmer, because I think there's some really unique things. And for me, it's a passionate area that we can talk about in regards to taking our understanding of the kinetic chain, hopefully deepening, deepening your knowledge base in regards to the motions and movements of the swimmer so that you can think about how to take care of that athlete. So let's first go back in time to some physics. <laughs> and hopefully that is not going to traumatize you too much. But it is important about that we consider these, these laws of motion when we're thinking about the kinetic chain. And basically, we can think of three specific motions that become important. The first law of motion, so an object at rest remains at rest until it is acted upon in regards to an unbalanced force, in which case it starts moving. The second law is that an acceleration of an object depends on both mass and the force applied, and that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if we want to move in a certain way, we have to fire the sequence of motions and movements, and that force generated will react with whatever we're pushing against and, and, and provide an equal opposite force that allows us to move in a specific direction or rotate in a specific way. And when we think about the kinetic chain in general, we're really vacillating between sort of kinetics and kinematics itself. So just by definition, the kinetics itself is this study of the cause of motions of an object. And this really uh, takes into account the force and the mass of that object it is. And it's, it's in essence how those forces are applied in, in the motion and movement. So as an example, it might be when we're kicking a soccer ball, how those forces are transmitted to that ball when it's kicked so that you can pass the ball or score a goal. In kinematics, we're looking at more about the things about position, the acceleration and change in that uh, object. And it's less about the force and the mass, but which may incorporate to some of those things, but really about the acceleration and change. So we're talking about terms of velocity and acceleration on how that might impact uh, uh, how a, um, a soccer ball might move or, or how we throw a baseball as well. But in reality, when we're often talking about these two things, we're sort of vacillating between both of them as well. Oh, sorry. There we go. And then when we think about the kinetic link, so for old school, you think about the old hip bone is connected to the knee bone, is connected to the ankle, uh, as your parents might say as well. But when we really think about this link, it's, it's sort of that sequential connection between all the different joints. And here we're looking at someone uh, throwing a baseball where all of those joints um, interconnected uh, segments need to provide some type of force movement and rotation within a triplanar type of movement. So whether we're moving forward and in, in, in order to, to throw the baseball and the amount of forces that go on there, you can see how pushing off the, 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 um, the mound uh, uh, causes that forward linkage. And then there's on the right-sided view, there's important of that rotational component to this as well. And really the mechanics and scientists have looked at, you know, the optimal way to sort of throw a baseball and where if you're throwing a certain type of, of throw, you might consider the horizontal and vertical displacement that's going on as well. And because we're three-dimensional uh, movements, unless you believe the universe is two-dimensional in a hologram, we need to take into account all, all the kinetics and the linkage of that from the lower extremity to the spine to the upper extremity and, and that movement that produces the force of motion and movement as well. 
And in thinking about this, we often talk about this proximal to distal sequencing event. Um, I think the important thing that we need to think about is this all starts in our brain. So that neuromuscular control is so important. We'll traditionally talk about how, how important the core is for transmitting those forces to the upper extremity, but let's not forget that, that our neuromuscular sequencing, how our brain activates our nerves to activate those muscles is an important component. So that mental aspect of thinking you're gonna throw a baseball activating the, the neuromuscular control is just as important in that proximal to distal sequencing as activating our trunk to then activate our upper extremity and forearm and hand in this uh, sequence to going from proximal to distal at well. And we know this is really important because you'll often hear how much force that comes through is, is based on how much is generated in the sequence. So we have this proximal to distal sequencing but then we also have this concept of summation of speed. So in the process of going from trunk to upper arm to forearm and hand, we also have to think about the summation of speed and how the generation of that speed can impact the next link in the chain itself. So if we were to look at the sequencing on the right and think about the timing of throwing a baseball, um, here we can see how in the in the sequence and events, we're looking at the hip, shoulder, elbow, where here the speed of the hip through this dotted line um, is starting, right? We start with the, the, the moment of moving. The hip is starting to rotate through in this sense at a certain specific speed. There's a transfer towards the shoulder itself, which is this next line. So the, the initial part of that speed of movement uh, is, is somewhat uh, similar in a sense in regards to the speed, not necessarily the angular rotation of it. But within that summation, you can appreciate how the forces then lead to linkage towards the elbow and hand and how the speed of those different specific um, uh, compartments move in, in, a, in a higher speed, in, in essence, uh, leading to transfer of those forces to the ball itself and the release, which is why someone can throw a baseball at up to 90 to a, up over 100 miles per hour while they're throwing. So it's not only the linkage of the trunk to the upper extremity, but then that summation principle of, of speed and transfer. And concurrent with that comes this thought of acceleration and deceleration. So in order to get speed, you have to sort of accelerate and there's an impact on this angular velocity of that as well. And in this picture right here, this concept I think is basically illustrated as we look at the, the different components. So this light blue in the timing is about the, the uh, uh, angular rotation and velocity of your pelvis. So we talk about that core and that movement as well that transfers then to the trunk. And there's a certain component of that angular velocity that comes into play and that transfer of energy. And you, as it goes from the pelvis to the trunk, it's accelerating and quickly decelerating, transmitting some of the speed and forces to the trunk. And then we can really appreciate how that then accelerates towards the upper extremity. And we definitely know that there's significant amount of angular velocity and speed that's impacted by this. So although the peak of that angular velocity in this picture may be slightly off in regards to the sequence of the, the arm to the elbow, to the hand itself, I think we can all appreciate about what the research shows that the angular velocity of say the shoulder is up to almost 7,000 degrees per second, which is a huge amount of movement. It's not depicted necessarily in the sequence, but um, that transfer becomes pretty important in regards to the functional movement that we have. And then we have to think about um, this concept of open versus closed kinetic chain movement itself. So I think most of us are probably familiar with this in regards to rehabilitation and exercise itself. So when we think of an open kinetic chain type of movement, you, uh, the, by definition, this is where the distal segment moves freely in space. So as you can see in this picture, um, you can notice how the individual is working on a specific movement overhead with a kettlebell. The distal segment of the hand, the kettlebell is free in space to move. These movements often typically involve a single joint and tar target a specific muscle when they're utilized from an exercise component. But when we think about how we're throwing a baseball, really that, that's an open kinetic chain type of movement where we're transferring that, that force to the ball itself. 
When we think about closed kinetic change types of movement, this is where the distal segment might be is fixed. And it often involves multiple different joints and muscle groups and in interaction and activation in a specific sequence and is much more multiplanar. So in the rehabilitative world of moving along in regards to uh, a closed kinetic chain movement, such as a squat, like here, um, that would uh, involve those sequences as noted. If you're thinking about the extent to which we're running, right, there's that closed kinetic chain component during the stance phase versus the swing phase that might be an open type of kinetic chain movement as well. But it's important when we're thinking about rehabilitation and movement to try and appreciate this aspect of open versus closed kinetic chain. And then the reality of this is, is that um, we put all of this together uh, to understand the complex interaction of all these different segments during a specific different uh, movement, whether that's throwing a baseball, whether that's, like I said, running, swimming, gymnastics, tennis, it all involves this complex interaction of this to accomplish the goal that we have. And it's really about us putting that all together into a sequence to really appreciate what's going on. So we have these basic concepts of understanding kinematics, kinetics, the, the linkage system in the kinetic chain itself, how there's that, that interaction of activation through proximal through distal, the, the summation of the principles of that speed, acceleration, deceleration. So let's move into then looking at some of the, the basic reasons why we care about this, right? And so it's with that movement that we care about preventing injury or treating subsequent injuries. And as we can kind of see on, on, on the left side, the, the, the flow in this tennis player in relation to the movement of the lower extremities and stability that transfer their shoulder could be impacted along the way if say hip rotation isn't appropriate enough with that, that someone's limited in that movement that may put pressure on the lower extremity or the spine, where abnormal motion in the spine itself may lead to, uh, to abnormal movement at the shoulder and scapular dyskinesis. And with that, we can get injury to the shoulder itself and the serve. So the kinetic chain really becomes, uh, uh, this linkage between the kinetic chain and the biomechanics becomes so important in understanding the motion and movement. And when we're taking a history, we're really gonna spend our time understanding the mechanism of motion that activation of that kinetic chain so that we can then figure out how that contributed to injury and prevent future injury. Obviously, within the realm of looking at of our patients, if this is a, a pitcher, then we're going to look at other factors that, that play a role, risk factors for prior injury, things like pitch volume and workload as well, and think about the uh, outcome tools to monitor that movement. Those specific things are beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but I think we can appreciate understanding the kinetic chain, understanding the specific biomechanics that go into that sport and understanding that sequencing can help us identify um, the extent of the injury and why someone might have gotten into trouble. Okay, so let's move on and start looking at some of the biomechanics. And we're gonna start out first with, with a baseball thrower. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, Dr. Bowers, you may have noticed this as well. When you look at some of the, the uh, images that are on in regards to the sequences of throwing, I'm always appreciate how when you're learning in Little League and you teach the kid, right, like show the ball away and then you throw it. But if you actually look at a lot of things online, the hand's actually the other way. So it took me a little while to appreciate the sequencing to find something that's probably more predictive of what we should should do as, as well in regards to that throwing. So I don't know if you've ever actually kind of noticed that in the cartoons, but um, kind of sends a little bit of a wrong message, I think. So. Um, so with that, let's talk about throwing and, and baseball itself. So um, um, here we have, in, in essence, which is a nice summary of the different phases of throwing and some of the unique events that seem to occur while we're throwing. And I think Hopefully most of us are familiar with these phases, including the wind up, the stride length, arm cocking, arm acceleration, and then basically deceleration and release with that. During this, this process of movement, what we're really trying to do is, is store up that potential energy through that linkage, transferring all of that energy and speed to that ball so that you can throw a specific type of fastball or whatever you're kind of throwing in hopes of uh, striking that individual out. 
So when we think about going through these phases, that wind up phase is really, really moving towards balancing and curling and coiling uh, with this, um, in this illustration showing that, that how the, the knee might be brought up for maximal height itself. And we're gonna look at a couple videos to see how this varies a little bit. You know, during this phase, we're really important in, in imparting all of that energy to get that velocity so we can move it in, in, in a forward type of progression itself. And we know that, you know, 50% of our energy um, in throwing comes from the spine and the lower extremity. So developing that tension in that area to then activate in sequence the lower extremity itself and transferring that from the trunk of the shoulder becomes so important while throwing a baseball. Now, as, a, as the, 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 um, the person throwing the baseball moves towards that forward progression, taking that energy, they'll stride forward into a foot contact. And with that, there's that forward motion of movement, which allows this closed kinetic chain activation of the lower extremity, but then this rotational transfer through the spine itself to the shoulder. During this part of the phase, most people who pitch will actually stride length at approximately 87 to 90% of their height, which is what you'll see most baseball um, athletes throwing at. And in that process of moving forward, they're taking that energy and then um, rotating through, which gets us to exact the arm cocking and acceleration phase. And this is where you often hear about the kinetics and rotation, right? The shoulder is now going uh, from a, into a more externally rotated type of position, which uh, depending upon the extent of rotation will put significant forces on the shoulder itself. As that energy is transferred, as I mentioned before, and the arm is accelerating through, the angular velocity of that shoulder is going up to 7,000, up to 7,000 degrees per second, which is just phenomenal and how quickly that, that can happen itself. Um, and that puts a lot of stress as we're moving forward onto the elbow, which is a reason the ulnar collateral ligament potentially could be at risk for injury itself. And then in tra transferring that along the kinetic chain and finally releasing the ball in the upper extremity, we have this follow through or arm deceleration where all of that energy and all that torque that's going into the shoulder and elbow itself has to be dissipated to slow down and transfer it. So for every action, equal option reaction. So all that energy and transfer is going into throw the baseball and allowing it to then go as quickly as possible to home plate in hopes of striking someone out. So hopefully most of us are pretty familiar with the extent of that where that occurs. What we wanna do now is take a look at this slow motion video, and we're gonna take a couple looks at some individuals and see how they're utilizing their kinetic chain to throw a baseball. So in this first picture or video here, we have Drew Storen, sorry, who was uh, drafted by the Washington Nationals. So for comparison with the next one we're gonna look at, I think Drew was 6'1", 200 pound, pitcher who basically would throw somewhere in the mid 90s in regards to throwing. And if we slowly go through and look at this, there's a few things that we can hopefully appreciate. And I'm going to get this back here. So as we started out in our first wind up phase, and we're, we're missing a little bit of that, but you can see how in this picture, Drew is pretty, pretty um, stacked and balanced itself. I think one of the interesting things to note through this is in this sequence of his throwing, he's really not raising his, his leg up too much, but look at the extent of the, you know, inter internal rotation of that hip itself. So he's looking at the batter to that, but he's really trying to coil. And for him, it's using that lower extremity coil to, 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 to provide that potential energy and movement itself. So as he's going through um, and coming through and moving forward, we can see he's starting to get into that um, stride here. Um, and interestingly here, I think the thing that we can notice is just how how sort of rotated he is in that picture that we saw, that illustration, it's almost like you put your arm back. But again, that rotational component of really pulling those forces during the stride length become important. So now we can see here with his stride length, and we can hopefully get an appreciation in regards to his height, how he's moving forward in a sagittal plane. And we're going to watch him start to activate and rotate that hip, transferring that um, energy and summation into the, the trunk itself. And then here you can really see how we're putting torque on the shoulder with that external rotation. He's showing the ball to the opposite side. 
and then really can see that the extent to which there's forces are put on the elbow in which he's throwing, moving forward, accelerating through in that cocking phase. And then really look at the extent to which he pronates, really just look at the extent to when we release the ball, we have to slow everything down, the extent to which you're pronating the arm to go through and then using the body to decelerate uh, as all of the forces have been transmitted through there. So we'll look at that one last time without me interrupting itself to really just kind of highlight the extent to which um, the kinetic chain is going into effect. And uh, Dr. Bowers, I don't know if you have any other comments or thoughts on what you kind of notice and see in this throw. I know I pointed out a few things, but I don't know if you want to chime in a little bit there, given your expertise in baseball and throwing. Sorry, I had to sit back down. I was literally going through the pitching motion. In my, <laughs> there you go. in my room with <laughs> with my stuff just working through um uh but no we'll t we'll talk about it at the end i have a couple of questions i'm i'm going to ask you as well but um okay at the end but nothing to add right now though okay fair enough with that so hopefully you won't stump me now here's tin lincecum so we're going to kind of go through him and maybe this is your questions <laughs> as well so tin lincecum uh a uw graduate as well uh with, drafted by the san francisco giants now tim's 511 but uh, weighed about 170 pounds yet he could throw the ball in the mid 90s as well and so what i like about this comparison here and we're going to go through this He's actually, this is live, so you can watch him do his windup and his throw, and it's from a different perspective as well, which was I included it. So as he's going through his cocking phase and moving through here, look at how much he rotates and how high he gets his knee in regards to that rotation. So I think we could really kind of appreciate that. His, his, his head's really rotated, his back's almost to the, 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 the batter himself as he's moving through. And then he... One of the unique things about Tin Lincecum is he has this huge stride length, um, which he utilized to make up for his power. So, um, so here, Tin Lincecum was known for um, um, having a stride length that was, in essence, up to 125% of his height. So as we watch him progress through here, again, similar motion, a lot more rotation and movement and balance as he's coming through. And you could see just how far he just throws that front leg out as he's rotating through, arching kind of the back and really getting a lot of force into the shoulder, elbow and hand as he goes through and pronating through. And then like most of them, really that leg's kind of kicking up through there. So I think we can get a good appreciation, hopefully of, of perhaps the difference in that motion and movement in those two. And the reality is, is that each individual may do this slightly different, utilizing the same kinetic chain forces of movement and movement. And part of that too will play into then where your shoulder might be positioned based on what you're throwing. Um, whether that's high up like these guys are, some people will do it more sidearm or submarine where it's kind of lower itself, but we're really focusing on that compression, uh, that activation of the sequent motation and movement. So hopefully you can kind of appreciate in these two slow motion uh, videos, the difference between them. All right. Well, let's move on to softball because um, another, you know, unique difference uh the softball right uh baseball pitchers throw something in the 90s olympic softball players will throw somewhere within the the the, the 60 miles per hour when they're throwing itself and the, and the phases of a softball throw are definitely different than than it is for baseball but at the same time we're again using these principles of the kinetic chain the sequencing of motion and movement to figure that out when we talk about the mechanics of softball we're talking about different phases and will often be referred to those phases in regards to a clock phase. So there's this wind up component where um, your the um, shoulder is extended to get, get ready to sort of uh, start the throw itself. By phase two, the ball is uh, uh, at, at six o'clock with the shoulder significantly internally rotated while we're starting to load the lower extremity and start generating that potential energy for forces. Um, as the, the individual and athlete moves forward towards the three o'clock phase, they're really starting to develop the momentum towards the shoulder itself. There's this rotational component that's happening as we get towards phase four, where the body is, is uh, the shoulder itself is up overhead. 
the, the, the activation of the muscles primary around the shoulder are helping to start throwing the body starting to um, really utilize pivot and, and rotation in the, the hips and pelvis itself to transfer that energy towards the uh, movement. And then as we move through the nine o'clock phase and ball release, there's a transfer of all of that energy and then that uh, deceleration through the, the, the follow through phase um, to allow the, uh, the, the ball travel towards the plate itself. And what I think is important as going through this, we talked about some of the forces around the shoulder, say people will talk about that angular velocity of 7,000 degrees per second, where in the peak angular velocity uh, in softball is more about the you know, two to 2,000 range or so through there. So the force is a bit different. The mechanics are a bit different and why the, although the shoulder may potentially be injured, um, it's it's different type of forces that impact uh, the individual throwing. So um, in summary, and this is a bit of a faster motion, but here uh, we have Amanda Scarborough, who's Texas A&M. She's uh, here throwing, a, you know, about 60 miles per hour, but I think uh, you can get a sense of, of how she uh, prepares and throws the softball. In this video, you can really appreciate in that wind-up phase, and we'll go back to it here and stop it, you can really see how um, she's preparing to get ready. And for her, her, her um, shoulder is really ex uh, extending significantly, almost all the way up to that 12, really almost compressing. You can feel the compression in that motion and movement itself as she's starting to store up that potential energy. And then she's gonna come forward with the opposite leg as she's moving through the six o'clock phase, really all of that momentum moving forward, pushing off that kinetic chain component, close kinetic from the lower extremity, building up towards the shoulder itself. And then we start getting that rotation in there as she moves forward through the rest of the phases, uh, decelerates the arm as she lets go. And often they'll, they'll uh, hit the side of their hip or their leg, which uh, may contribute to some of that deceleration. And based on that, that law of motion, the transfer of energy goes to the softball and allows it to move at, at uh, over 60 miles per hour itself. So again, just looking at that one last time so we can appreciate the extent of the kinetic chain in action here. And again, people will do this at different degrees and different motion and movements in regards to exactly how they do that, but the, the motion and movement is pretty similar. All right, let's move on to the lower extremity. Um, so in this, this section, we're gonna look at, at running. We're gonna specifically look at sprinting versus long distance. If someone is running a marathon itself, as a reminder, when we think about walking versus running, the important part to consider is that in running, there's this float phase where in essence, there's a uh, double limb is unsupported. Um, and when you think about walk, whether walking or running, it's a series as, of, of uh, specifically running, a series of single leg stances that occur that require coordination of the core. And we often talk about the gluteus medius as we're moving through. And when we're walking, the phases that go from heel strike to mid stance uh, and uh, foot off, that stance phase uh, was where we spend most of our time. And it's quickly transferred to that swing phase as we move the leg through. As we progress towards running, the phases change a little bit, right? Because there's this, uh, this float phase where we're transferring that energy, allowing us to float through more quickly. So our stance phase, uh, and swing phase shortens a little bit in that regards. We still have that component of where during the stance phase or heel strike, and depending whether you're running sprinting or or whether you're you're running a marathon, uh, where you land, we say heel strike, but sometimes it's midfoot or forefoot, but you are loading that energy or loading your body weight through the lower extremity, activating the kinetic chain in regards to the core, the glutes to the lower extremity itself absorbing that energy through, through those ground reaction forces through mid stance. And then as we push off, um, right, transferring that energy back, there's a sagittal component with that forward movement, but there is some rotational component in, the, in regards to the spine stability and this counteraction of with the arms that allow us to move quickly throughout. Um, so these are the basic sort of phases and mechanics of, 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 of running. And here we can kind of appreciate this in action. So Here's a video of uh, uh, Allison Felix, one of the, the, the great sprinters of the US team. Um, and we're gonna look at her uh, in sprinting. Um, she runs a 200 and uh, 21.69 seconds as we can appreciate. And we're gonna go through this again. 
in in her when she's taking off here here we have a sprinter right the the kinetic chain really coming into effect here so at the starting block balanced compressed waiting for the starting gun to go off there you can appreciate i think in this sequence the activation right the neuromuscular trail is going to get the the muscles tense and then there's that kinetic chain summation of activation of the core muscles proximally to push off distally and that sequencing itself so as we're looking through this activation and movement again watch as she starts taking off just really the activation of all the different muscles and movement uh and I think you can really appreciate that and show slow motion, transmitting those forces through, throwing that leg forward, allowing a little bit of rotation in, in the hips, yet still staying stacked well enough to allow her to move forward and sprint pretty quickly. Here we can see her in the, the relay, again, just that stack component um, as she's running, but that, that huge stride length and activation of muscles that allow her to land and transmit forces itself. If we go back and actually look at her running here you can really get a sense of of as you're sprinting she's she's going into that stance phase and landing forefoot to to um, midfoot to forefoot through there loading and we, when we load right we know those forces are anywhere from seven to ten times our body weight landing pushing uh down and forward transferring that energy through the through the the kinetic chain of motion and movement and sprinting and if you think about it you know, Allison, so she ran a 200 meter in 21 seconds. She's basically running about 20 miles per hour in doing that. So you can get a sense of that motion and movement. Now let's compare that with some marathon runners. So here we have three, um, a Kipchoge, who is uh, the world record hold in the marathon is first, um, Shura Katata second, and then Mo Farah, which is uh, also well-known um, individuals running third here. What I like about this, and if you think about it, we had Allison is running at 20 miles per hour uh, in, in a short period of time. Kipchoge, who has the world record, um, two hours and one minute and what, nine seconds in the marathon, in essence is running a pace of about 13 miles per hour. And when we appreciate this mechanics of loading, you can really get a sense of how their stride is, is, is a little bit different, right? There's more of this midfoot uh, loading that you could appreciate in the kinetic chain. They're activating that component of landing. And let's stop this for a sec here, right? He's he's landing during that stance leg. It's coming up. He has this sort of stacked position in regards to the transfer of energy in this closed kinetic chain. The opposite leg is coming forward in the open kinetic chain. What I like a little bit about this is to see how stacked Kipchoge is where Katata is a um, little bit more forward running style it's himself. So you can see how his his body mechanics are slightly different. And I think Mo Farah here just makes it look so easy. It looks like he's just running through and, and, and just landing in a similar fashion in regards to his foot placement, those ground reaction forces being transferred throughout so that they can run at a pace about 13 miles per hour. Just pretty amazing to kind of see through there. So we've had a few examples uh, of, of how we can utilize the kinetic chain and, and our understanding in regards to the overhead athlete, the, the running athlete. Um, as I mentioned, I have an interest in swimmers. So we're gonna go through some of the unique aspects of looking at the swimming kinetic chain and hopefully provide a little deeper dive in regards to the mechanics of swimming as well. So one of the important things I think that you need to think about in swimming and the uniqueness of this is that swimmers have to deal with water. And with that comes, uh, in essence, the various forces that are, are counterbalancing each other. So buoyancy plays such an important role, right? So Archimedes' principle is basically that uh, a body of water um, will be, dis uh, when a body is submerged, it displaces a certain amount of water and that provides a force that is involved. And often this buoyancy force can be different from the center of mass of that individual who's swimming. And, and forces involve drag and, and thrust impact the way that the swimmer can move. And when we think about this, what is important is, is, is breathing can affect how we lie in the water itself. So by, as an example here, you can see, here's that center of mass where someone's balanced and moving and how you breathe can so impact your buoyancy in the water and, and your position as well. So if you're 
depending upon how you're breathing and your head's too down, that'll impact and cause certain type of resistance in motion and movement. If your legs are heavy and you're more elevated, that can impact things. And so in swimming, we have to think of not just about the center of mass and movement and kinetic chain, but also how center of buoyancy plays a role in that as well. And that becomes important as we're uh, taking a look at these athletes themselves. So going back to understanding our forces in a swimmer, so right, for every action, uh, an action, right, the first thing is that someone's in motion, they get movement. As a swimmer starts moving, they're trying to increase propulsive drag or force to move them forward, and that's counterbalanced in regards to the frontal force itself. And this speed is a constant battle between the acceleration and deceleration of these two forces in multiple planes, whether that's forward, back, or, or rotational as well. And the swimmer is always trying to optimize and, and catch the water. So when they push on the water, that's the equal reaction that pushes them forward as well in the opposite direction. So when we're thinking about swimmers and moving in the kinetic chain, we have to understand the physics component of, of those first, second, and third law with those principles of buoyancy and center of mass while we're moving through as well. And so um, with that, sw swimmers spend a lot of time thinking about motion and movement and streamline. So resistance is such an important component of this, and there's different forces of resistance whether that is the frontal uh, component, the forces that are coming through um, as we're moving in frontal through drag, there's skin forces or drag, which is impacts is how water flows through, and then positioning can play a role that can lead to eddy forces that, that might impact how the individual is moving as well. So to optimize drag, um, often swimmers will like to be streamlined in regards to the motion and movement and water flow. And if they aren't, then they'll have these impacts of resistance uh, in large drag that in can, can impact the flow of motion and movement itself. And this doesn't just start with the core and the body, it goes all the way down to the extremities. So um, there's a lot of work that's done in regards to forces of movement, even on the hand. So if you're swimming, um, just spreading your fingers off a little bit through the physics um, allows a better opportunity to, to provide lift and movement and force in the hand than if you have your finger fully closed. And swimmers will work on, on, on really optimizing every single motion and movement throughout this in regards to uh, their specific design. And swimmers are designed differently in regards to how their body types are and how water flows through itself. So when we think about swimming and we're thinking about the kinetic chain and the motion and move in the mechanics, it's important to understand the phases of the mechanics of swimming because um, how someone get injured maybe impact this thing. So most of us will think about swimming and think about the different strokes, but I want you to also think about the start, um, what we call the underwater breakthrough the actual swimming. So the start itself um, is so important and can represent a fraction of a section that can be the difference between winning and losing. So here we have Caleb Dressel, one of the, the premier swimmers on the US team. Um, what I love about this, if you think about the kinetic chain and the storage of that energy throughout, you can really see how he goes from this comp compressed type of movement to, to progressing forward and using all of his body strength up until the last little distal segment to push off of the block itself. And, and, and this is important in regards to the kinematics and kinetic change. So anyone who's done swimming knows that you, the swimmer gets on the blocks, they'll say on your mark to get started, and there's a compressive force where they pull onto the, the starting block itself. And the one that the, the um, when the bell goes off and then they start or the alarm goes off, they still they have to take all that kinetic chain motion and movement, transfer that so that they can dive into the water at a streamlined premium angle to allow them to quickly go through. And in the kinetic chain of swimming, the takeoff of the block is so important. There's that contraction of the muscles and a sequencing event that's the storing of potential energy and that sequencing and activating of the muscles, the transfer of that energy is all the way to the toe is what's needed to provide provide that, uh, that motion and movement throughout. And then that energy is transferred, laid, transferred into the water itself. So swimmers spend a lot of time uh, working with underwaters and breakout where they come through the surface and the optimal positioning of those mechanics as well.
And so often you'll see uh, swimmers doing underwater dolphin kicks. And what I think this uh, diagram nicely shows is, is sort of the different motions and movement that occur. So in maintaining that streamline of the upper body, we can appreciate how the joint angle and motion of the movements of the shoulders uh, themselves are pretty streamlined um, and straight. Uh, itself as as noted in sort of the blue and the orange through here. But that really accentuated movement in the hips, pelvis, knees, ankles is uh, illustrated by the motion and movement over time in regards to the hips itself, uh, the knee and the ankle. And we can appreciate that activation in the timing sequence of all this and in, in understanding our kinetic chain as well. And then we have the swimming, swimming strokes itself. And I think it's important to appreciate that right? most swimmers learn to swim four different strokes. And um, you know that's pretty unique because of the difference in motion and movement. We'll often talk about these long axis strokes and freestyle and backstroke, where the rotation is along the long axis of the body versus breaststroke and butterfly, which are more short axis strokes along the axis of the hips itself. You know, I think of uh, maybe gymnastics as being another sport where where the athlete has to train on different apparatus that require different motions and movements. So in a similar capacity, they need, unless they're specializing, really need to kind of train on all those different things and understanding the mechanics and biomechanics of those special, special um, strokes or whether that's with gymnastics and movement or tennis or whatever becomes extremely important. In swimming, we can break down the sequences as well. So this is the phases of a stroke in swimming from this early catch phase where your, your hands entering the water and catching the water itself, pulling through, pushing right for every action, to equal reaction, maximizing the amount of water you're catching around, along the hand, forearm, shoulder itself, pushing through in that phase to accelerate forward with uh, utilization of, of a variety of, of the muscles around the recovery phase where you get your arm back into proper position. And that's propelling us forward, yet rotating somewhat along that long asset, access to, to, um, to, to provide the forces that go through there. And I really like this video here because it really just shows you the true sequencing of events as we're working through these different styles. So on the top two, you can see the freestyle and backstroke with those long axis type of strokes. You can see as a, on the left with the freestyle, how the hand is entering the shoulder motion and movement between internal external rotation, the activation of the core and kicking throughout. Backstroke is in a similar fashion, but you can really appreciate the, the, the activation of muscles there as well. In the lower side, lower two illustrations, you can really appreciate that short axis mo moment, and that's in sort of rotating along the hip itself and activation of the lats and the shoulders and the lower extremities in a sequence that's a little bit more complex, but is designed to maximize uh, force and movement and motion, and motion from a proximal to distal component of it itself. And then we have the flip turn. We're still not done itself. So as we're going into the flip turn, we're still utilizing the kinetic chain. We're, we're, we're moving through. And one of the unique things is, as, as uh, younger athletes are learning and, and, and moving into the wall, it's amount, the amount of that, that velocity and movement in performing a, a flip turn requires optimizing that energy and then really that push off off the wall as they turn through itself. So again, it's that component of of activating those muscles in a specific sequence that allow that push off as well. And so if you think about it in swimming, if you're swimming 25 yards back and forth, back and forth, that could be over a, a quick, you know, 20 seconds if it's some type of sprint if at elite level, or it could be, you know, anything for up to 15 minutes uh, if you're doing something like a mile uh, at, at a certain level. There's, there's a lot of repetitive motion and movement throughout that they have to go through. So we're going to use this video here, and we're going to focus on Caleb Dressel and looking at the the sort of summation of of of, of the kinetic chain through here. And this video highlights really the extent to which you can see Caleb jumping off and very quickly getting that wonderful underwater with that the undulation and motion and movement throughout as he's swimming this hundred m. He has a, a, a little bit of a lead coming in. We're going to appreciate how they push through and off the wall and look at the extent of that. That, that movement in regards to the kinetic chain and how they just grab the water and push through. Interestingly here, you can see how he gets a little bit tired and, and Chomlers, who's the competitor right here, will come in and, and, and get close, but just not enough 
to, to, to try and beat him out uh, in regard to the sequencing. But I think we can appreciate the, the power and source that goes through there. So if we go back really quickly and look at this, you can appreciate, oh, let's see, how they're starting off the block, compressed activation that kinetic chain to get us out and into the water itself, underwater, really appreciating over here, Caleb Dressel, and then undulation to use in the dolphin kick to get us moving through. As we're getting into our, our flip turn itself, going into the wall and that explosive power, it's like really like a squat jump if you think about it, with some rotation. Again, getting that flotion, motion and movement throughout the kinetic chain uh, of the extremity to move through. And then always going into the end as far as you can go to, to, to make sure you touch the wall first and here really just winning by a fraction of a section second to get us through and in there, so. All right. So with that, hopefully I, we have some basic principles in regards to understanding the kinetic chain and the pivotal role it plays in the complexity of biomechanics and sports. And understanding the kinetic chain and the biomechanics becomes so important for whatever athlete that you're seeing and asking questions. Dysfunction in that kinetic chain can obviously lead to injury, and our job is to try and understand the complexity of that. And then as you're rehabilitating someone or trying to prevent injury, developing an individualized uh, evaluation of that athlete and focusing on some of the static and functional components of it will hopefully help correct the issues that got them in trouble and hopefully allow them return to competition and prevent future injury. So with that, I know it's a lot of information all at once on a variety of different sports, but I'm going to stop sharing and we will go to the questions. I think Dr. Bowers had maybe a few if I haven't touched on them, and I think there's something in the in the chat. Yeah, thanks so much. That was great. I hope everyone uh, that is tuning in here and on YouTube later realizes you know how much of a privilege it is to have you give this specific lecture. So thank you mu so much for that. Um, so th just a, a comment and and you had kind of asked me earlier as we were talking through baseball and kind of put me on the spot and just so in thinking about it, I think when you show videos of Storin, and Lincecum, and you realize in these high-level throwers, everyone has their, their individualized mechanics that they're comfortable with to the naked eye. But if we, if you have videos of them and you break it down and you pause at the key points of the motion, they're going to be in the same spots that they need to be. Are they, are they balanced when you come from a baseball standpoint in that, that first kind of stance phase? Are they balanced on their back leg? Are they then in the stride phase kind of accelerating downhill? When their foot lands, is it where is it placed? Is it in the optimal position? And, and I think these high-level throwers are going to have that. And you you talk about the rest of, of these things. You have some knee flexion when the foot lands. Where is your shoulder and abduction and external rotation? Uh, and then as you move through the acceleration phase, when does the pelvis rotate? When does the trunk rotate? Um, and then as, as you're also moving through acceleration, is that front knee extending? really well. And, and so if you take these, these pitchers, you're going to find that they're going to be in the points that they need to be these really high level throwers, even though to the naked eye, you feel like their mechanics look different. And, and so that's just a, a key point and, and something to think about when you're looking at mechanics of a thrower. Mm -hmm. And also just how important it is in young kids that we teach them mechanics. I think with all the, the injuries that we're seeing in young kids now, and, and especially with early sports specialization, how, how important mechanics are in the young kids before they develop the velocity and the power when they get older and they, they reach growth maturity, that their mechanics are on point because if they're not and they develop the power and velocity and then their mechanics aren't on point, they're gonna be at such an increased risk of uh, of injury. And so I think just for those of us in medicine that see these people to understand the kinetic chain and mechanics, to be able to, to, you know, convey that to kids and their parents and coaches, when we talk about them, that those are things that they need to focus on. So those are just my, my two cents real quick. There, yeah. there are, um, so there are a couple of questions here that I'll ask, and then I have a couple of, you know, kind of 
taking what you just talked about and, and putting it into the clinical side of things. Yeah. So I'll ask uh, Alvin's question first. And, say, and I, it sounds like he may be getting at the same thing. It's often a challenge to evaluate the athlete in clinic because we are not seeing them in the field or on the court. What dynamic functional movement tests, like a single leg squat, do you commonly use in the clinic? Yeah, I think, you know, this is a great point, I think, and just to, to amplify what you said, right? Um, we need to think of mechanics, and there's some consistent things that happen throughout, but, but right, but everybody's an individual, right? My, my, I'll, I'll do it with swimming, right? My leg length in swimming is the same as Michael Phelps. My torso is not right. And, and they've actually tried to look at things. And so with this, people will go on and they'll say, okay, I want to swim like Michael Phelps. Well, unless you're designed like Michael Phelps, you're not going to exactly swim like Michael Phelps, right? If you're designed like lithium, whatever, right? So I think Dr. Bauer's key point is that um, that you'd need to individualize this and help people understand. Translating that to our clinic. So, so I think there's some basic things. And when I talk to parents, it's it's just amazing now, actually, with, with phones and iPads, people often have my mechanics going on. So if you for the first time you're seeing someone, ask them if they have any of those mechanics that you can look at on the phone itself, because it gives you real-time movement. And if you don't and you're bringing them back, ask them to take some videos and photos so that you can kind of look at those things. I do think depending upon the sport and what we're looking at, there's a few things we can do in the clinic to help figure that out. Obviously, there's the static component of looking at someone in regards to how their bodies are, are the alignment, the, the, the amount that they might have some limited motion or inflexibilities. There's the um, the, the muscular component of looking for asymmetries in movement. I think uh, if you're looking at a runner, looking at single leg stance is a great way. And I would add that not just doing a single leg stance, like a pistol squat or something where they go down, but I challenged athletes to do that with their eyes closed because proprioception is so important. And it's amazing how you can pick up some little functional movements and instabilities when you have them close their eyes and try to do that movement. And um, I, we have athletes run down the hallway. We're fortunate enough to have a treadmill in clinic where if I really need to, I can put someone on a great example of an ultra marathon runner who would lean over time. So we actually put them on the treadmill for, for a good amount of time while I ran clinic and we came back and we looked at, and I'm like, what are you doing? You're leaning to the left. They had no clue how much they had moved over. So and if you have the luxury of doing that, that's great as well. Um, I, besides balance, um, for swimmers, I like putting people in quadruped and having lift opposite arms and legs. I think um, that's a great way. Swimmers swim mostly in that horizontal plane, and you can look at how they activate their core and can hold the, their arm and leg in a, in a linear position. And a lot of times they'll start rotating and move, movement as, as self. Um, it's a little harder. Like, again, we can go to our gym. We have a rebounder. We could give someone a ball if we want to really look into kind of uh, looking at the motion and movement of that. But um little bit harder to do within the clinical setting. Um, I like to, for the baseball pitcher, uh, look at the posterior shoulder, I think is, is key and important in regards to strength and that scapular kinesis, because a lot of them, they're strong, but they just don't really have that posterior activation. And that's so part, it's so important for keeping that humeral head in the proper position and movement as well. So so I think there's a few things as I outlined for maybe different sports that you, you could look at. Um, Dr. Bowers, you got uh, any other tips of things you like to look at? Yeah, so Alvin stole my thunder because that was kind of what I was going to get out to to ask you. And so I think specifically for, for a baseball player, just like you said, always look behind, look at the, the shoulder blades, look at scapular motion, I think is so important. And also really looking at the hips as well, because we know that uh, you know, stiff hips and decreased hip range of motion is correlated with injury of the shoulder and in throwing athletes. And so focusing on the hips and also just like you said, single leg balance. And and I think that's a an awesome idea that I probably don't do enough of is having them close their eyes and work on the proprioception and then have them do a single leg squat just to see because they can really focus when they're doing it on keeping their knee over their toes. Um, but but that single leg squat, hip range of motion for sure, posterior shoulder. And then if you have the ability to, if they wanna look it up, the Y balance test is one that, that has been shown to, to correlate pretty well. And you can do a Y balance test if you just have some tape that you can lay down in the office. And, and I, I'll echo 
as well. It, it just with how easy it is for us to get video, just telling patients, hey, look, if you'll just take the video two angles on your iPhone and either you have that now or next time you come in and be able to look at that uh, to just be able to see what their mechanics look like. And, you know, we're trying to develop something here at Emory, just a, an easy, simple to use model and kind of checklist that we can give to parents or give to coaches where they can say, okay, you have these iPhone videos and now you can just kind of quickly look through and kind of grade the mechanics and then bring that back into us and we can look at it over time. And so those are kind of the quick things that I like to do in the setting of we can give these long talks on kinetic chain, but how do we bring that back and then apply that to a patient that we have 20 minutes to see in the office. Yeah. One other pearl I think too is um, I often ask, especially with the swimmers, but I think you could do this with anyone is, or, or you could do with, right? Uh, if you have a picture, like, hey, what are your coaches working on? What are, what are they telling you that you need to work on? Oh, I don't extend my arm out enough, or I don't rotate my core enough when I'm throwing, or my arm's too far, you know, here or there. Um, it, it can really clue you into some of the mechanics and, and motions and movements that might uh, allow you to, to then hone in your specific physical exam skill and in, 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 in hopefully assessing that individual. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, anybody else in the audience have any further questions? Because again, that was my main question was bringing this back to, to the clinic and, and just from a CAQ standpoint as well, just realizing that they're there definitely can be questions here on kinetic chain and biomechanics of some of these sports. So just understanding the phases of motion in some of these certain sports from a CAQ standpoint certainly are, are questions that can be asked and ones that, that I remember I had as well. So I don't see anyone else. We got 10 seconds to throw another one in there unless you have it. And I don't see any, so... Wow. Um, well, thank you for right. having me talk here and uh, um, yeah, that appreciate was, everyone that coming a, here. You know, I think, uh, again, hopefully hopefully you walk away with a few little pearls um, and, and different things to think about in your clinic. It's, it's a good day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so great privilege to have you speak on this topic. And thanks again to everyone for tuning in for this installment of the Fellows National Online Lecture Series. We'll see you next week for the Sports Neurology Talk. And thanks again to Dr. Krayback for, for a great lecture. So thanks so much. Thank you.